Good afternoon and welcome back. I hope you all had a, a great lunch. Um, now we would like to start the session on controlling nuclear weapons. I also would like to introduce the chair for this session, Professor Nicholas Emmanuel, Soka University. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so to begin, uh, we, have, we actually have six people on this panel, so it's a full panel, and we're gonna try our best to hold them to about 12 minutes per, per person. 12 minutes, doesn't, it goes very, very quickly, uh, but hopefully you guys, we can stick to this. So to begin right off the bat, we're gonna start with Miss Audrey Kitagawa from the International Academy for Multicultural Cooperation. So I welcome her, and if you can feel free to go up and make your presentation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. For this privilege to address the ethical, moral, and spiritual dimensions of controlling nuclear weapons. Ethics comes from the Greek word ethos, which means way of living. It is concerned with human conduct, and more specifically, the behavior of individuals in society. Morals deal with standards and rules of good conduct in society, and law as a cognitive process regulates social life through the promulgated rules crafted by a legitimate authority. Ethics and morality are sometimes used interchangeably. Morality and laws are inextricably inter intertwined because morality has affected the formation of the legal system and the rules of conduct in society. These adjudicatory bodies and processes are designed to render justice. Using the word spiritual relates to the human spirit or soul as opposed to material or physical things. The foundational premises of the codification of treaties, conventions, declarations, and regulatory functions which laws are designed to address come from an inherent recognition of the sanctity of life and relates to the spiritual dimension. This spiritual dimension manifests in multitudinous forms and structures, but simultaneously transcends them. It is therefore universal in its nature, even as its manifestations appear specific. Ethics, morals, and the spiritual dimensions are foundational to what we are discussing today on controlling nuclear weapons. We must always remember that true security must be ontological security which is that sense of stability that emerges in response to the need to experience oneself as a whole continuous being and having a positive view of self, the world, and the future. But what have we seen in the past 78 years since the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki? We've seen one nuclear weapon state grow into nine, with Iran perhaps soon becoming the 10th and Saudi Arabia indicating that it would also seek to own nuclear weapons when Iran acquires them. We have heard the president of South Korea declare that if North Korea's nuclear threat grows, South Korea would consider building nuclear weapons of its own or ask the US to be deploy them on the Korean peninsula. We've seen the ramping up of spending on nuclear weapons. China is expected to quadruple its nuclear war warheads to 1,500 by the year 2035. The U.S. is in the midst of modernizing and extending its nuclear stockpile at an anticipated cost of $600 billion over the next seven years. Japan's military budget doubled in one year's time. The mushrooming insecurity which we are facing is due to the proliferation of nuclear weapons, the provocative conduct of the nuclear weapon states that is ramping up reactions toward greater militarism and the deepening distrust that is taking place in the ability of our leaders to work towards greater security that cannot be found in nuclear weapons as the 78 year history of how we have been conducting ourselves demonstrate. We have seen Russia's aggression, not only in action, but also in words, as President Putin last month delivered a warning to the West 
over Ukraine by suspending participation in START, a landmark nuclear arms control treaty, announcing that new strategic systems had been put on combat duty, threatening to resume nuclear tests and planning to deploy tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus. It's a neighboring ally from which he staged part of his invasion of Ukraine. Ukraine had at one time been the third largest possessor of nuclear weapons. It was persuaded to relinquish those weapons by Russia, the UK, and the US. Ukraine did not want to give up their nuclear weapons. The Budapest Memorandum, signed on December 5th, 1994, resulted in a multilateral agreement affirming Ukraine's security and sovereignty in exchange for giving up its nuclear weapons. States are using weapons of mass destruction as threats and displays of supremacy in a dangerous power play, creating a distorted sense of what true power is that purportedly makes the world safe and secure for everyone, but which is now determined by the members of this nuclear weapons club that pose the biggest danger to global security in its power plays. The ethical, moral, and spiritual dimensions of controlling nuclear weapons require completely abolishing them. They are the most inhumane, destructive, and indiscriminate weapons ever created. Their existence undermines global security, planetary, and human well-being, and has diverted valuable resources from meeting human and environmental needs. However, taking cognizance of what has transpired in the last 78 years of nuclear weapons history, no first use of nuclear weapons policy for all nations would be a positive step towards strengthening trust among nations and facilitating constructive dialogue. China and India are the two nuclear weapon states that have committed to no first use of nuclear weapons. Secretary of State George Shultz, who served under US President Reagan, said that trust is the currency of diplomacy. Trust is a firm belief in the reliability, truth, ability, or strength of someone to deliver on agreements or promises made. It is therefore imperative to counterbalance the forces of growing fear and insecurity over nuclear weapons by adhering to the commitments that are made. It was the development of trust that allowed Presidents Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev at their summit in Geneva in 1985 to say, a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. This statement was part of a larger statement announcing that the countries had agreed to an ongoing process of dialogue to reduce nuclear risks and to promote non-proliferation and disarmament. Their relationship of trust created measurable results in the reduction of nuclear weapons of both countries. While 2022 saw setbacks in the field of nuclear disarmament, in November at the Bali G20 summit, the following words were issued. The threat of use or use of nuclear weapons is inadmissible. What shall we say about the word inadmissible? Perhaps at the very least, this can be interpreted as an obligation to extend uninterrupted the record of non-use since 1945, and consequently, to cease any and all threats to do otherwise. The threat or use of nuclear weapons has previously been judged as generally in violation of international laws of warfare, including international humanitarian law, by the International Court of Justice in 1996. And in 2018, the UN Human Rights Committee affirmed the threat or use of weapons of mass destruction, in particular nuclear weapons, which are indiscriminate in effect and are of a nature to cause destruction of human life on a catastrophic scale, is incompatible with respect for the right to life and may amount to a crime under international law. Until now, the nuclear armed states had taken a permissive approach to the ICJ advisory opinion, misinterpreting it as permitting threat or use of nuclear weapons in extreme circumstances, and had disregarded the opinion 
of the UN Human Rights Committee. The UN also created the Humanitarian Laws Framework, from which the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons arose, and was successfully brought into force on January 2021. It recognized in its preamble the concerns about catastrophic humanitarian consequences that would result from any use of nuclear weapons and recognized the consequent need to completely eliminate such weapons. It acknowledged the ethical imperatives for nuclear disarmament and the urgency of achieving and maintaining a nuclear weapons-free world, which is a global public good of the highest order serving both national and collective security interests. The TPNW was a good faith effort by the signatories of the NPT to meet their responsibility to pursue effective measures of disarmament. However, upon analysis, we find that the G7 nuclear states have not adhered to the NPT and each state is in violation of their obligations under Article 6 of the NPT. All nuclear weapon states demonstrated non-compliance. Non-compliance of the UK, France, and the US of the NPT demonstrates a major way that G7 states need to adhere to commitments regarding nuclear weapons. The 2022 summit endorsed the joint statement of the leaders of the five nuclear weapon states on preventing nuclear war and avoid arms races but these five countries have not followed through. When leaders do not honor their commitments, they're opening the door to legitimizing conduct that says the exercise of creating laws is meaningless because we do not honor the laws we create. It is giving on some level licensure to the erosion of the institutions of democracy and the protection of human rights and the security which humanitarian laws are designed to protect. According to Dr. Tarja Kronberg, a former member of the European Parliament, the claim that nuclear weapons only serve defensive purposes, deter aggression and prevent war, is contradicted by these states' nuclear policies. Nuclear deterrence is still considered relevant in dealing with contemporary security issues and an important part of the official strategy of the US to fight traditional threats. The existence of nuclear weapons and the threat of using it in a retaliatory attack is as immoral as an initial attack, and we must stop utilizing it as a false equivalent to true security. The G7 has made few commitments on disarmament in recent years, with none made in 2019 and only one in 2022. In 2022, in Elmau, Germany, the commitment was a statement that the G7 are united to resolve to advance implementation of the NPT. Unfortunately, the Elmar nuclear statement had the lowest compliance of the 2022 commitments. This year's Hiroshima summit must reverse this trend and raise the nuclear issue to the highest priority as a stark reminder of why nuclear weapons must be eliminated and as a heart of the disarmament of the peace movement. Hiroshima is where this issue must be elevated, demanding more attention and action. And I would like to conclude by saying that we have a moral obligation to do everything we can to eliminate nuclear weapons. And in the meantime, in light of the many difficulties in being able to accomplish this, all civil society actors should mobilize and participate vigorously in creating the tipping point in the court of public opinion to persuade political leaders to remember the sanctity of life requires the abolition of nuclear weapons and honoring all of our commitments made to control them. And final comments. When things look bleak, let us redouble our efforts and constantly remember and strengthen our moral compass to do the right thing. Martin Luther King said, we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. We must learn to live together as brothers or perish together as fools. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. We shall overcome because the arc of the moral universe is long, 
but it bends towards justice. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>
possessing nuclear weapons, as well as nuclear dependent states. We believe that adopting the doctrine of no first use by nuclear armed states would significantly stabilize the global security climate and help create a much needed space for bilateral and multilateral dialogue toward ending the conflict. The policy of no first use would also operationalize the recent statement by the G20 leaders that the use or threat of use of nuclear weapons is inadmissible, as well as the statement by the P5 countries in January last year that a nuclear war cannot be won, it must never be fought. Certainly, such declaratory policies must be accompanied by changes in actual postures and policies, such as taking all nuclear forces off hair-triggered alert in order to build mutual trust. Overall, no first use would be a critical step toward reducing the role of nuclear weapons in national security and serve as an impetus to advance nuclear disarmament. We therefore urge that G7 leaders should seize the opportunity to discuss and announce the strategies of risk reduction, de-escalation, and disarmament, particularly by declaring the policy of no first use. The second area I would like to focus on is G7 leaders' role in advancing multilateral disarmament discussions. At last year's NPT review conference, member states were unable to reach consensus on the final document. As we prepare for the next review cycle, it's critically important that G7 leaders take bold leadership and renew their commitment to fulfill obligations for disarmament stipulated under Article 6. And equally important would be to engage in further exp explorations on the complementarity between the NPT and the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, TPNW. If G7 leaders were to stand by their commitment to advance nuclear disarmament, their constructive engagement with the TPNW would be necessary. We especially hope that Japan would fulfill its commitment to be the bridge builder by engaging productively in the TPNW discussions, recognizing that despite divergences in approaches, all countries share grave concerns about the potential use of nuclear weapons. We strongly hope that G7 countries will demonstrate their willingness to work cooperatively with the TPNW states parties by committing to attend meetings of states parties to the treaty in the future. And next, I urge G7 leaders to take the opportunity of the summit in Hiroshima to reaffirm their commitment to create a world without nuclear weapons and take concrete actions toward the end. It is often said that a world without nuclear weapons is the ultimate goal. However, we have to be absolutely sure that we achieve this goal before nuclear weapons destroy our world. There have been some calls by experts to set the year 2045 as the absolute deadline for the elimination of nuclear weapons. At the Hiroshima summit, G7 leaders could possibly agree on setting such a timeline and determined to begin negotiations toward that end. Such commitment should be coupled with actions, including issuing agreements to create, to cease, sorry, cease production of new, new weapons and weapons grade fissile materials and reducing existing nuclear stockpiles, including negotiating a follow on to the New START Treaty. Last, as an organization committed to promoting peace and disarmament education, we call on G7 leaders to demonstrate their support for educational initiatives at every level. We strongly hope that they would set an example by visiting the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum and meeting the atomic bomb survivors to directly hear from them, their experience and catast catastrophic impact of nuclear weapons. To shift the current security paradigm dependent on nuclear weapons, we must transform the way people think about peace and security and change the dominant narrative that nuclear weapons keep us safe. We need to raise the public's awareness that the surest way to avoid a nuclear war is by eliminating those catastrophic weapons 
that there is no such thing as building our own security at the cost of insecurity of others. For this reason, a nuclear abolition proposal put forward by the SGI president in 2009 states that if we were to put the era of nuclear terror behind us, we must confront the ways of thinking that justify nuclear weapons. The readiness to annihilate others when they are seen as a threat or as a hindrance to the realization of our objectives. Shifting the public narrative at such fundamental levels would be a challenging task. For this reason, we ask for the G7 leaders' commitment to make available the opportunity for everyone, especially but not limited to young people, to learn about the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. We welcome Prime Minister Kishida's initiative for the Hiroshima Action Plan and establishing a youth leader fund for a world without nuclear weapons. We hope Japan will exercise its leadership to affirm that the purpose of such education is not to provide only the education about disarmament, but education for disarmament. To close, I will argue that the current tensions and uncertainties in the global security climate elevates not undermines the value and role of dialogue and diplomacy. It means that the forums like the G7 and the United Nations serve more important functions than ever. As part of the civil society, SGI stands ready to support multilateral efforts to resolve conflicts through peaceful means and achieve a better world together. On the occasion of the 10th review conference of the NPT last summer, we joined over 100 religious and faith-based organizations from around the world to issue a joint interfaith statement. It reads in part, and I quote, our diverse faith traditions remind us that we are not prisoners of our current reality. Each of us are creative, resilient, and capable of creating a world we desire, unquote. As a person of faith, I express my great hope and confidence that as a species, we are capable of resolving our nuclear dilemma and finding a way out of our extinction. And I would like to end my presentation by following Audrey's lead and sharing some words from Dr. Martin Luther King. Quote, when our days become dreary with low hovering clouds and our nights become darker than a thousand midnights, we will know that we are living in the creative turmoil of a genuine civilization struggling to be born." Unquote. In the time of darkness, let us work together to break the dawn and create a world free of nuclear weapons. I thank you. Thank you, Anna Akira. appreciate your, your comments. Uh, the next speaker is Mr. Jonathan Grenoff, president of the Global Security Institute. I want to thank the organ organizers of this conference, the university that's hosting us, and I want to particularly thank the two speakers that preceded me. Very difficult to follow both of these inspiring, insightful, and substantive presentations, so I'll do my best. There's no good hands for these terrible arms. The weapons themselves present a problem that's unique. The more the technology of nuclear weapons are perfected, the less security we obtain. They themselves are more of a problem than any problem they seek to solve. If they're good for some, then they will stimulate the proliferation where others will get them. If others get them and they continue to exist, by accident, design, or madness, they will be used. Therefore, the only solution is to fulfill the legal obligation contained in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty to negotiate their elimination, to fulfill the unanimous ruling of the International Court of Justice to negotiate their elimination, and to follow the dictates of conscience that each of us within our own hearts can look into the reality of these devices that could actually end human civilization 
at the women fancy of one person on any given day. Because we now know that if less than 2% of the 13, uh, less than 14,000 nuclear weapons in the world today were to go off, it would throw at least 5 million tons of soot into the stratosphere, ending civilization as we know it by rendering the agricultural base defunct. So we've moved from mutually assured destruction to self-assured destruction. We have now entered into a period in which, um, in which we are creating devices which could end the magnificent endeavor of human beings. This is unprecedented in human history. And we're not any wiser than people ever were before. In fact, when we look at the horrors of Ukraine today, or the horrors of Syria, or Sudan, or Iraq, or Vietnam, or Hiroshima, we know that good countries are capable of terrible things. There is no country that is so pure that it could have these weapons in perpetuity and ensure that they will not be used. We are frail, ignorant, selfish, and loving, and wise, and compassionate creatures. And we have a choice before us at this moment in history. We can either go down the path leading to a horror beyond imagination, or we can change course. The current course at this moment says, what happened to Libya when it gave up its weapons of mass destruction? What happened to Ukraine? What happened to Iraq? What happened to North Korea? We've set up a system that is privileging the possession of these horrific devices. Now, let me just take a look at it. Just step back a second. Imagine if the Biological Weapons Convention said, no country can use smallpox or polio as a weapon, but we will permit nine countries to use the plague as a weapon to maintain international peace and security. We would say that's absurd. It's morally incomprehensible and it's impractical, which it would be. But it's precisely the system that we have with nuclear weapons. So pressure has to be put on the states with nuclear weapons to live up to the promises that they've made pursuant to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the third most important legal instrument of the 20th century, the first being the UN Charter, the second being the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the third being this instrument, which has very effectively kept the number of nuclear weapon states in order. But in order for the treaty to gain its indefinite extension in 1995, promises were made to fulfill the commitment for disarmament, test ban treaty, fissile material cutoff treaty, strengthening international atomic energy safeguards, nuclear weapon, uh, weapons of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East. In 2000, 13 practical steps to walk down the ladder were iterated. And in 2010, more of them but they haven't been fulfilled. Good faith has not been de demonstrated. The treaty cannot last if promises are not kept. And the very, the very lifeblood of peace on the planet, which is diplomacy and the rule of law, is corroded when promises are made and not kept. If diplomacy fails, then bullets become the only verbs that countries can use to communicate. So much is at stake at this moment. And much opportunity is presented at the summit in Hiroshima. Because Hiroshima tells us what our future could be. Hiroshima also tells us what our future could also be when you go there and you see the spirit of the people that they've rejuvenated their humanity. You go there on a Saturday night and people are enjoying and celebrating their lives. It's astonishing, the resilience of the human spirit to rejuvenate. It's astonishing how nature and the regenerative processes of nature can heal so quickly. 
The same problem of our war with nature is the same problem of our war amongst the nations. We're on the wrong bus. We're using the gifts of science, technology, and social organization to make ourselves an endangered species. We have to use the tools of wisdom, communication, love, diplomacy to thrive. That's what's before us. And at this summit, there's an opportunity to contribute to that change. I strongly endorse the uh, previous speaker's suggestion that one of the first items of business is a no first use, not just a no first use pledge, but a legally binding prohibition against the first use of nuclear weapons whether it's by agreement amongst the parties with them, a Security Council resolution. It would be good if we had a General Assembly resolution. It would be good if pledges were made, but it would not be good enough because the stakes are so high, particularly high because of the failure to live up to the commitments in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. A no first ple use, use pledge would be good. Would that be good enough to save the treaty? I don't know. But if there's steps to move toward a legally binding prohibition, that would mean that deployments would have to change. That would change a great deal. And we have to move in that direction. We also should, a fairly low-hanging fruit, it seems to me, would be negative security assurances, codifying the promises that states without nuclear weapons should not be threatened with nuclear attack. Now, are these things very, you know, are they, these things very far out of reach? I don't think so. Uh, China has a no first use policy. India has a no first use policy. And the President of the United States, when he was campaigning, ran on a sole purpose of nuclear weapons being to prevent them from being used. Oh, uh, we, had a, uh, we had a president who was a very right-wing president, Ronald Reagan, who helped turn us from having over 65,000 down to less than 14,000 by turning the tide, by building, uh, by building bridges of trust. People say, oh, that's so impossible. Look at, look at the divisions now with Russia and the United States and NATO and the divisions in the world in the Middle East, the divisions here and there, but you know, there were hundreds of years of war in Europe, and now it's, it's, now it's almost inconceivable. We had most of the 20th century, the brutality between Germans and French is unimaginable. The killing fields of World War I and the brutality of World War II, and yet it's inconceivable that they would, do, that they would go to war today. People can rejuvenate, people can change, people can come back to their humanity. Albert Einstein said, the splitting of the atom has changed everything but our thinking. And we drift toward catastrophe. But the kind of thinking that we're hearing from SGI, the kind of thinking we're hearing today, resonates with the kind of thinking that the wise have told us, wise men like Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell, who in their famous manifesto said, remember your humanity, forget the rest. Put our humanity first. And several times today we've heard of the idea of human security. But our paradigm of security is essentially from the Westphalian con conference of the latter half of the 17th century, a horse and buggy road designed to prevent Protestants and Catholics from slaughtering each other. The framework is the nation state, when the reality is the planet Earth. My grandparents, if they saw a picture of a mushroom cloud, they would have thought of mushroom soup because they didn't have any idea of atomic bombs, nuclear bombs. And if they saw a picture of the planet Earth from outer space, they would have thought of a marble. But these are the two icons of our age. One is the planet Earth, one living, miraculous place where love exists, where the human family can thrive. The other, the mushroom cloud, a hell that we've created for ourselves out of fear and ignorance. God has given us the gift of creativity that allows us to go beyond the stratosphere and take pictures of this 
blue marble, an infinite space in which this miracle of the human community can thrive. The choice is ours. I'm going to finish a very important point. When activists like myself advocate for nuclear disarmament progress in the United States, we are told that our allies don't want this. We are told that the Japanese people, that the, that the country of Japan will become a nuclear weapon state if there's progress on nuclear disarmament. It is imperative that the government of Japan speak out and say the truth of the matter, the people of Japan want progress on nuclear disarmament, want progress on nuclear nonproliferation, and they should not be used to block progress in the world. That is an important message that can take place in Hiroshima and change the world. I pray and I hope that the truth be told. Nuclear weapons can and must be eliminated, and we all have to work together to do this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Graham. Uh, I'd like to also ask uh, Ms. Rory Daniels, the Managing Director of the Asia Society Policy Institute, to join us and share her thoughts. Well, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, first, let me thank the organizers of this conference for allowing me to come and present some views that I have on how we could control uh, nuclear weapons in the current international environment. Um, I also want to thank my fellow panelists who have argued passionately for the elimination of nuclear weapons um, and have not only, I hope, inspired the audience, but certainly inspired me to, to think hard about um, you know, what the tasks are ahead of us. Um, so I, you know, would like to speak about this critical topic of controlling nuclear weapons um, in the context of a multilateral meeting of some of the top economies in the world by focusing my remarks on global governance and what multilateral or minilateral institutions can do in the current international political environment to improve the nuclear nonproliferation regime. And my bottom line up front is that the task, the urgent task ahead is for the US and the G7 countries to restore trust in the rules-based order by reinvesting in that order. What makes the rules-based order work is that the most powerful countries in the world agree to voluntarily constrain some of their power in order to turn zero-sum dynamics into positive-sum dynamics. And what I'm observing today instead is that this global governance regime is under intense pressure from the changing balance of global power, particularly from the rise of China and U.S. reactions to that rise. Um, so while, we should, while it would be most helpful to global peace and stability for the U.S. and its allies to continue to find ways to turn zero-sum dynamics into positive-sum dynamics, we are actually running the train in the other direction. We are creating zero-sum dynamics where none need to exist. The U.S. has labeled China as a strategic competitor, and this framework and its underlying assumptions um, have massive implications for the global governance regime. The, the still growing strategic mistrust between the two most powerful countries in the world makes it very difficult to put a stable floor under this relationship. Even as both sides state that they would like to avoid war, they are preparing for it. And put simply, as long as the US and China are emphasizing each other as a threat, and particularly as an existential threat, then there is little hope to compartmentalize the areas where the two countries disagree so that these two countries can work together towards common goals and interests. China on one side and the US and its allies on the other side are trapped instead in a classic security dilemma in which actions one side feels are defensive in nature are seen as aggressive by the other side. 
This heightened tension is exacerbated by a lack of communications between the U.S. and China and by an increasingly wide definition of strategic competition that not only includes security competition over discrete issues such as um, the status of Taiwan or the South China Sea, but is now also has economic dimensions, technological dimensions, as well as a competition over values, human rights, and norms. So this large scope of competition has led to both sides labeling the other not just as a strategic competitor, but as an existential threat. So why am I up here on a panel about nuclear weapons talking about US-China strategic distrust. It is because I believe these definitions that we're creating are drawing us down a very dangerous path in which both sides can excuse any conduct, partnership, or strategy that is in service of lessening the threat of the, the other poses regardless of the consequences. China's support for Russia, for example, is seen through the lens of a counter US coalition. And the US is reacting and responding to China's rise by what it sees as strengthening deterrence, which is adding to an arms race in Asia and justifying further modernization and expansion of China's military weapons and technology. Actually, an effective deterrence strategy, um, if you study it and from a classical doctrine, has two elements. One is a, uh, a signal or a force posture that shows uh, what would happen if another side, if the other side took a move. The other is a communication with that side, um, explaining, you know, exactly what, how that force posture is defensive in nature. And without having the communication to actually explain a defensive strategy these uh, actions that the U.S. is taking in coordination with their allies are seen as offensive in nature by the Chinese and contributing to this downward spiral. Reversing this trend and finding a way toward the policy both sides say that they want, where um, the two sides could simultaneously work on common interests while competing over some issues, um, requires a better definition of strategic competition, what we are competing over and why. And I do not believe we can achieve this policy goal of having areas where the US and China can cooperate on effective global governance, including nuclear nonproliferation, an area that will absolutely take the combined effort of both sides to address while we label each other as an existential threat. Um, this doesn't mean that the US and, the ally and its allies have to agree with China's interpretations of values and norms or with China's narrative of victimization at the hands of the US and its allies, but it does mean questioning whether US-China state-to-state -state relations are the best venue for addressing all of these issues all of the time. Having a robust and active civil society is an enduring strength of democracies, and particularly of the G7 countries. And I would suggest that we try to find a better division of labor and more trust in the civil society process to carry some of the burden of this values competition. Um, the US needs to hear about the unintended consequences of its overly broad China threat perception from its friends and allies. The G7 should include discussion on reconciling the domestic U.S. political conversation where China is absolutely being used as an excuse to, um, you know, as, as, a, as a mechanism to excuse failures of U.S. governance um, with what is needed for global peace, stability, and prosperity. And from there, to define a hierarchy of needs on nuclear nonproliferation that acknowledges trade-offs between absolute security and global stability. The member countries of the G7 should also invite scrutiny of their own conduct as well in a nothing to hide strategy to legitimize an equitable system of arrangements in the eyes of the member states and the global south. And this includes continued scrutiny and monitoring of the AUKUS nuclear submarine projects that have been recently announced. It includes the US formally joining international agreements and mechanisms that it has long supported, such as the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and the International Criminal Court. Again, we cannot let China be the motivating factor of abandoning the rules of the road. We can't compete with China by becoming more like China. 
And the U.S. has to be willing to accept some constraints on its power to lead, as President Biden has said, by the power of our example rather than by the example of our power. By focusing so heavily on China, we are not giving our full force of attention toward what is an equally, if not more, dangerous trend, which is nuclear coercion from Russia and from North Korea. And ultimately, it's the conflicts that underpin this coercion that are the real existential threats posed by nuclear powers against the U.S. allies and partners. So with this, I applaud the passion um, with which my fellow panelists argued for a no first use policy, which with I substantially agree. Um, one positive trend, though, that we should highlight, especially here in Japan, is the, the upturn in the Japan-South Korea relationship. The events of the last few months prove that countries with deep mistrust and complicated histories can find common ground through bold leadership. I think that this is a, a really important year to highlight uh, the ability of South Korea to positively contribute to the G7 agenda. I applaud the government of Japan's decision to invite Korea to come as a guest to the G7. And I would argue that it is time to start thinking about Korea as a more long-term partner in the G7 agenda. Um, if the G7 is, as some argued this morning, a, a type of caucus for other multilateral fora, including the G20, then South Korea has a lot to offer to the agenda. Um, not only is it a critical partner in the technology supply chain, um, it is also a victim of the economic coercion that the G7 countries would like to develop a good strategy um, to counter. So it's a critical partner in resilient supply chains and countering economic coercion. It's also um, a country with deep experience in nuclear, nuclear coercion. And I think that it has a lot to offer in how we deal with North Korea and the North Korean nuclear threat. My own um, opinion on how to deal with North Korea is again, that we need to invest in the rules of the road that we've, we have created ourselves. And that means that we need to demonstrate to North Korea that there is a viable roadmap forward to lifting some of the UN sanctions. At the moment, North Korea, uh, we have not exactly enumerated to North Korea what it needs to do to lift sanctions. And that allows North Korea to excuse its own behavior um, in ways that are contrary to the entire nuclear nonproliferation regimes. Um, what do we lose when we approach the international system with strategic competition and distrust? I can tell you that between the US and China, we have completely lost our dialogues on the peaceful use of nuclear technology um, that had been running under the strategic and economic dialogue between the US and China for many years that were focused on how to um, effectively use nuclear technology for cancer research. I mean, obviously this is an area where the world should agree that we have common cause, but because we approach China with such strategic distrust, um, we are not able to do the, the normal state-to-state -state work of working together on areas where we can agree. Um, another area that we've lost, and I'll end on this point because I have very little time left, is that the U.S. and China used to work together quite a bit on reducing the stockpile of weapons-grade uranium in the world. By, um, by converting highly enriched uranium reactors to low enriched uranium reactors and research reactors. And I believe that we could continue to raise ambition in the G7 to continue to reduce the amount of highly enriched uranium in the world by moving to low enriched uranium mechanisms. Um, there's no reason for research reactors or military equipment to continue to contribute to or justify the stockpile of nuclear grade material in the world. And ultimately, I believe that highly enriched uranium machinery should not only be phased out, but it should be added to the list of prohibitive machinery and in international agreements. This would close an important gap between the need for nuclear research to drive innovative products and the potentials for states to sell or use highly enriched uranium for nuclear weapons development. And it would reduce the amount of weapons grade material in countries that are holding onto it for military purposes. The G7 could be a critical venue to raise ambition on this topic, and I hope that it will be included in the Hiroshima agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Reynolds.
Next, we'd like, I'd like to invite Ambassador Nobuyasu Abe, the former director for the Center for the Promotion of Disarmament and Nonproliferation and, and the Japan Institute of International Affairs. Thank you. Uh, how are you today? Uh, I have uh, had already four speakers before me, and uh, they touched on a number of points I'm going to raise. And uh, that shows you may become boring to you, but uh, uh, in the meantime, I think I, it seems uh, I'm on the right track. So the f five points I wish to emphasize today in regard to G7 summit in Hiroshima, uh, it's the nuclear issues. First is uh, there should be reaffirming the goal of achieving a world without nuclear weapons. Second, they should be embracing TPNW, uh, Nuclear Weapons Ban Treaty. Currently, all of the G7 are against the treaty. Third, there's an ongoing war in Ukraine. We have to definitely prevent use of nuclear weapons there. And in the meantime, we may be able to succeed in devaluing the value of nuclear weapons. Maybe strange to hear, but uh, that is uh, my interest. Fourth, we should be, they should be endorsing the Reagan Gorbachev axiom, there's no winner in a nuclear war and it should never be fought. Last of all, the G7 leaders should be calling for nuclear no first use or in a different expression, sole purpose of nuclear weapons. First, uh, achieving a world without nuclear weapons. Well, this is now today a very much uh, well-known phrase. It's a goal set by President Obama in Praha, 2009. G7 leaders should uh, uh, reaffirm this goal. In the meantime, until we achieve a world without nuclear weapons, there should be some concrete steps to be taken leading to the goal. One of them is reducing the risk of unintended or accidental use of nuclear weapons. This is uh, very important in a practical, immediate sense. The number of weapons, they should be freezing and gradually reducing the number of nuclear weapons. Also, as uh, uh, Prime Minister Kishida also advocates, reduce the role of nuclear weapons in national security policy. That includes nuclear no first use. Uh, also, strict application of international humanitarian law. This was touched upon by uh, Jonathan and uh, some other people. The basic problem with the nuclear weapon is so devastating, hugely destructive. By being so, it is indiscriminate. It kills not only war fighting soldiers, but also civilians. That's prohibited under international humanitarian law. If you apply the law very strictly, there's very limited cases where you can use nuclear weapons. Otherwise, you'll be indicted as a war criminal. Uh, bring the CTBT, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, into force. This is uh, important because without testing, you cannot really develop nuclear weapons. For example, North Koreans are continuing testing because they need to do so. If you st stop them, you can stop their development. Negotiate and adopt uh, an FMCT, Fissile Material Cutoff Treaty. Nuclear weapons cannot be made without high enriched uranium or plutonium. This treaty will stop production of those material. By doing so, you can stop production of nuclear bombs. Embrace the TPNW. Nuclear Weapons Ban Treaty is adopted and signed and ratified by a great number of countries. But 
those countries who have nuclear weapons have not signed or ratified. And also those countries, Japan, Germany, Italy, other countries in NATO, have not signed, ratified. In addition, those countries are telling other countries not to sign, not ratify. This is a bad treaty. They are be being hostile to the treaty. I think that is totally wrong. Particularly a country like Japan, who has been against the nuclear weapons for so many years, should not be behaving against this treaty. Rather, they should be friendly to the treaty, at least, even if because of the security concerns, because of the US-Japan security treaty, Japan may not be able to sign and ratify the treaty right away. But even so, Japan should not behave hostile to those countries. Rather, it should embrace the treaty and those countries who are in the treaty. And Japan can do so. In the last meeting of the parties to the treaty in uh, uh, Vienna, some countries, even the US allies, joined the meeting as observers. Germany, Australia, Netherlands, some other country. Even New Zealand, even though there's a dispute whether still New Zealand is a US ally or not, but anyway. Japan could have participated as an observer and joined exchange of views and finding a way how Japan can help those countries. Japan didn't, unfortunately. I'm sorry for Prime Minister Kishida in that sense. Uh, Japan should have been more uh, aggressive. Uh, also, even countries may not be able to join the treaty right away. There are many things they can do. For example, treaty has a provisions to help the victims of nuclear weapons or nuclear tests. There are people in Kazakhstan, Australia, uh, in some uh, Pacific Island countries, and Algeria, who are suffering from the consequences of the nuclear tests. Japan can help those people because Japan has experience of treating people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They have a big, good medical expertise. Also, the treaty has a provision about uh, environmental remediation, which means after the land was contaminated in Australia, Algeria, or Kazakhstan of nuclear testing, there's a radiation remaining. You need to clean to go back again. Japan also have, has expertise in this because unfortunately, Japan had a Fukushima nuclear accident. They had gone extensive decontamination works. They have a expertise. So why don't join the, those countries and help them to work on the re remediation. They can do so. So uh, last of all, uh, Japan should also stop joining the other countries, US and other countries who are in fact campaigning against joining the treaty. Uh, sometimes those countries threaten the countries in Africa, in the Pacific, or in Asia. If you join the treaty, we'll stop or reduce our economic assistance. That's a terrible way to do so. Japan should not be joining that kind of efforts. Ukrainian war. There's a terrible war going on. Well, uh, I need to spend another day to discuss the uh, illegality of the war, but uh, anyway. Uh, it is against the basic principle of the UN Charter, which says respect of uh, territorial integrity, respect of sovereignty, not interference in domestic affairs. Russia tried to overthrow President uh, uh, of Ukraine. It also is against the Budapest 
memorandum, which said, if Ukraine give up, gives up uh, nuclear weapons, other countries, US, UK, and Russia will respect the sovereignty and uh, territorial integrity and in independence of Ukraine. Russia broke them. So uh, it's a terrible uh, warfare. Uh, interesting, if you read the, carefully the Budapest Memorandum, it says uh, the parties signing the memorandum promised to seek immediate Security Council action to provide assistance to signatory, which is Ukraine, if it becomes a victim of an act of aggression or an object or threat of aggression in which nuclear weapons are used. Exactly this is the situation. And to refrain from the use of nuclear arms against signatory Ukraine. That's exactly what the Russians are threatening every other week. So um, it is urgent task for the G7 member states to prevent use of nuclear weapon by, by Russia. And uh, this, well, the US, for example, has been uh, telling the Russians never try to use nuclear weapons, otherwise there will be terrible consequences. Well, uh, this is, uh, uh, once it is used, it can cause a significant escalation of warfare between Russia and US and NATO. Uh, but even though President Putin and uh, other Russian leaders are from day to day threatening to use nuclear weapons, but in fact, it's not easy. There's a 70, 70 years of uh, non-use of nuclear weapons. Uh, it is, even for Russians, hard to use them. So uh, if, this is still if, if this war ends without Russians using nuclear weapons, in a way it can reaffirm that nuclear weapons has weapons have only limited utility. It can certainly prevent Americans or NATO to go into direct war with the Russians. But it they are helping the Ukrainians continue resisting. And the weapons weapons threats are not helping Russians to win this war. You can see the war fighting in Ukraine. Russia is not succeeding. So if we can succeed preventing Russians from using nuclear war and end this war, we can tell the people, look, Russians had nuclear weapons, but they could not win the war. It's not, it has only has a limited utility. So tell, we can tell the people in, around the world, don't try to get nuclear weapons. So this is uh, something we may be able to achieve. Uh, endorsing Reagan Gorbachev statement, many people said already, uh, called for nuclear no first use or sole purpose. This many people said already, so. I can, I think I can skip. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thank you. Next, uh, we have a virtual uh, Zoom uh, presentation by Professor Mitsuru Kurosawa, a Professor Emeritus at Osaka University. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, my name is Kurosawa, uh, Professor Emeritus, Osaka University, Japan. And uh, the title of my presentation here is G7 Summit Hiroshima will be good opportunity for nuclear disarmament or should be good opportunity for nuclear disarmament. 
So that is my message at first. And I highly appreciate uh, this is a great pleasure and honor to join this conference. So I highly appreciate the organizers for my invitation. Okay, one slide before that, you know. Yes, this is uh, how they say current international environment. It's a table security environment. And there are two reasons. One is uh, Russia's attack to Ukraine and threat to use nuclear weapons. Many panelists already took that. And they are a clear violation of international law, including the Charter of the United Nations. That is one part. And second is a legal restraint on strategic nuclear weapons will be lost unless a successor treaty is concluded by 2026. And uh, currently, this possibility seems extremely low, so that there will be no legal restraint on such nuclear weapons soon. So the situation is terribly bad. And the G7 summit uh, not necessarily emphasized the issue of nuclear disarmament in past conferences. And one is uh, seven years ago in Japan, Isashima summit. And there are two, uh, how do you say, uh, demonstration. One is a leader's declaration. We reaffirm that non prohibition and disarmament issues are among our top priorities. And commitment to seeking a safer world for all and creating the conditions for a world without nuclear weapons. This is the G7 summit itself. And just after the summit, President Obama flew from Isashima to Hiroshima in the evening. And he visited the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum, uh, read with at the Hiroshima Memorial Park, delivers a very powerful message for our free of nuclear weapons, and met with atomic bombing survivors. So this time at Hiroshima, seven leaders got together, so they should have this kind of occasion. Okay, next, please. This is the last year's G8 Elmo in Germany. And the leaders communicate includes three paragraphs on the nuclear disarmament. We are united in a resolve to comprehensively strengthen the NPT. So the NPT should be strengthened. And the NPT is a cornerstone of nuclear non prohibition regime and the foundation for pursuit on nuclear disarmament. So NPT is based for non prohibition regime and also nuclear disarmament. And number three, G7 reaffirms its commitment to its ultimate goal of world without nuclear weapons. That is the last year's uh, final talk. From now on, I talk to you on the coming G7 Hiroshima summit. And uh, this summit will emphasize the importance of nuclear disarmament. What the reasons? There are four reasons. The first is a president of the Hiroshima summit is a prime minister, Fumio Kishida. And he is a very strong supporter of, and uh, also promoter for nuclear disarmament. And he is a representative from Hiroshima city. He always says that nuclear disarmament is his life's work. So among the many prime ministers of Japan, he is uh, the most strongest and uh, supporter and the strongest promoter in the history. So we can expect much better outcome with 
appear in the Jizen Sunny. And this is uh, somehow, as I said, Hiroshima Action Plan proposed by Prime Minister Kishida at the NBT level conference in August 2022. And uh, there are five points. Importance of continuing the record of non-use of nuclear weapons. So the Russia is threatening the use of nuclear weapons. So it is a very important message. And second, the enhanced transparency. So it is also uh, necessary for we find the progress in nuclear disarmament. And number three, maintain the decreasing trend of global nuclear suppliers. Otherwise, there may be a big nuclear arms race between the United States and Russia or United States and China. So this is also a very important message. And number four, a secure nuclear non-proliferation. In particular, uh, North Korea or Iran, something like that. And number five, encourage visit to Hiroshima and Nagasaki by international leaders. So the G7 summit to Hiroshima is a very good or best opportunity for seven leaders to meet in Hiroshima and uh, they can do what President Obama did seven years ago, but more than that. So these five points should be included in the communique of the G7 in Hiroshima. Then I uh, speak about the six recommendations for the G7 Hiroshima summit. And number one, they should criticize Russia's aggression to Ukraine as well as its threat to use nuclear weapons. So many panelists already said this one. So this is one of the most important message at the Hiroshima summit. And I think it will be appear with no doubt. Second, uh, they should announce a strong message against activities that promote nuclear prohibition. So keep maintain the health, uh, good health of the nuclear non prohibition So such as recent aggressive activities on North Korea, including the launch of many missiles, as well as Iran's strong pursuit to make nuclear weapons. So this is uh, one of the most important issues of this NPT, and we should agree this one. And number three, <clears throat> we should strengthen the norms that strictly prohibit the attack on the peaceful nuclear facilities, including nuclear power plants. So NPT includes peaceful uses of nuclear weapons, uh, nuclear uh, uh, uses. So in order to keep that principles, as Russia is doing such kind of things, we should strictly prohibit the attack of the nuclear for France or something like that. Number four, uh, they should encourage the United States and Russia to come back to negotiations or dialogue on the reduction of strategic nuclear weapons. So uh, currently it seems to be very difficult, but G7 members should collectively encourage Russia to come back to the negotiation or dialogue or for the framework for the next uh, strategic nuclear weapons reductions. And number five, they should repeat their determination to pursue nuclear disarmament with the ultimate goal of a world free of nuclear weapons. This seems to be a little too easy because ultimate goal, I didn't want to, I don't want to use this word, but when we think realistically, G7 members are all nuclear weapons or nuclear alliance. 
depend on the nuclear codes. And in a short time, it's impossible to reach the world free of nuclear codes. But as a long term purpose, they should keep this world. And the last one, <clears throat> they should start the negotiations that are for nuclear risk reduction that will prevent unintentional use of nuclear weapons. These topics of nuclear risk reduction is very popular, even at the 2022 NPT review conferences. And there may be uh, uh, big opportunities to start dialogue to reduce the nuclear risk in order to prevent the intentional use of nuclear weapons. So I submit here six recommendations here. And uh, this is, this summit is uh, one of the best opportunities and uh, should be one of the best opportunity to promote nuclear disarmament toward a world without nuclear weapons. Thank you very much for your that's the end of our panel. We got six people. We had a lot, a lot of very interesting dialogue or, or uh, comments, which kind of, uh, in my opinion, came together uh, to a certain extent. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone. Let's give them all a hand. And thank you. Are there any questions? Yes, Dean Koide. Yes, thank you very much. Um, excellent uh, presentation by six speakers. Of course, we have a representative from civil societies in this panel, and also one distinguished professor who has been working on the role of civil societies in, um, yes, NP, you know, uh, nuclear. Uh, re reduction movements, I'd like to ask the role of civil societies, especially in the context of controlling nuclear weapons. Well, we sometimes um, assume that state-to-state -state relations are trapped into zero-sum game. You know, states are sticking to its own uh, interests, so they, are diff they have difficulty in um, escaping from the uh, yes, uh, prisoner dilemma situation, like uh, nuclear uh, tensions. Whereas civil societies can find a room uh, for a uh, win-win uh, situation. Because uh, from a viewpoint of civil, you know, human beings, civil societies can find the shared interests. But Today, many people know civil societies are being divided very extremely. And in many liberal democracy countries, people's you know, uh, civil societies are, in a sense, mobilized by SNIS to the very nationalist whole. And the, I think uh, Director Rory Daniels, uh, you touched on the recent South Korean president's visit to Japan. Um, and I really appreciate President Yun uh, Soyol's uh, visit to Japan as a sign of the better um, bilateral relations. But in fact, after he came back to his own country, his visit was is being criticized uh, by the uh, South Korean public as a very humiliating diplomacy. And on the Japan side too, uh, the uh, reception of uh, South Korean president. Uh, um, you know, um, by simply forgetting the recent trouble uh, in the bilateral relations are also uh, criticized by the Japanese uh, public opinions. So sometimes state leaders are more flexible based on their own, on their uh, real, you know, realism uh, thought. You know, they are uh, talking about the rise of China, uh, North Korean rise, rising nuclear threat, that's why South Korea and Japan have to cooperate. But you know, uh, the public opinions or civil societies of the two countries, 
South Korea, Japan are more rigid you know, about their own interests. You know, maybe imagine or mobilize interests by, again, you know, uh, SNS. So, well, you know, as a long experience, uh, civil society leaders, I'd like to ask how challenging it is, especially recently, to uh, persuade civil societies to play a positive role in overcoming the state-to-state -state, um, confrontations or contradictions. That would be my question. Well, thank you for that. Um, I think you've very correctly um, identified a lot of the dynamics that are at play in civil society. Um, there's there's no easy answer to this question. If there was a silver bullet to say, well, we can turn the opinion of civil society, which has long been influenced by what states and state leaders say about um, their own interests, then, um, then we might be in a very different place. But in fact, the very hard work that needs to be done now is in people-to-people -people relations. Um, that is how you can transform uh, a relationship between two societies. And it is not a um, overnight process. Um, but Time, I think, is on South Korea and Japan's side right now to begin that process again. Um, uh, President Yoon will, you know, barring any um, significant uh, civil society movements inside South Korea, will be in, in leadership for several years. I do think that the motivating factor behind this new rapprochement is, as you correctly identified, an increasingly common threat perception um, in the neighborhood, underpinned by um, you know, US support for a stronger Japan-South Korea relationship. But ultimately, these are two democracies, and the future of their relationship belongs to the people. So what I would recommend, if um, I can be, you know, so bold is that the state-to-state -state relationship needs to be underpinned by academic exchanges, by tourist exchanges, by cultural exchanges. It needs to involve some sort of reconciliation that surfaces all of the feelings that the two societies have toward each other um, in an open and transparent and constructive way. And without doing that very difficult but essential people-to-people -people work, um, it will be difficult to sustain the state-to-state -state relationship at a, at a new level. I actually have a follow-up question to Ms. Daniels because uh, you were talking about uh, when the intractability between state-to-state -state relationships exist and the tensions are there, that civil society uh, can be involved in the process to carry the burden. And I know that you are a track to diplomacy expert and you have a lot of experience in this regard. So I wanted you to share with us how effective do you think track to diplomacy is in this particular aspect? Thank you. Um, well, I think Track 2 has the potential to be incredibly effective in um, addressing some of the blockages at the state-to-state -state level, um, but it needs to be invested in at the Track 1 level in ways that I'm not seeing happening right now, um, particularly in some of our more intractable conflicts, which is between the U.S. and China and between the U.S. and North Korea. What Track 2 can do is reframe issues um, in ways that make them potentially more constructive, but it requires the official level, the Track 1 level, to be receptive to that type of reframing and to use Track 2 as a tool um, in order to, to investigate specific points of inquiry. Um, I have seen it work before. Um, I've even seen it you know, work to a certain extent in South Korea-Japan relations. Um, I think in 2018, I believe it was 2018, I was involved in a track two um, at the time that the intelligence sharing agreement between Japan and South Korea uh, was under threat due to some of the many um, 
long-standing issues with wartime forced labor um, and the Korean justice system, the way that it is continuously going back and relitigating these issues, um, and uh, export controls that Japan had placed on um, South Korea, you know, in relation to these disputes, and um, a reframing of the issue at the Track Two level actually did lead to a breakthrough that allowed the suspension of that agreement to be delayed. Um, so, and the, I, I can't speak to the specifics because of the confidential nature of the discussion, but I will say that the way that the issue was reframed um, took, was, was very self-reflective. And that's what we need more of in these conflicts. We need um, we need officials and scholars to be quite self-reflective and be a little bit less focused on criticizing the other side's behavior and a little more focused on how we can reframe ourselves and our own issues in order to move um, these things forward. But um, but at the moment, I think that the real challenge here in Track 2 is not coming up with new and creative ideas. It's the receptivity of the governments to adopt them. I want to qualify that a little bit. Um, sh we shouldn't wait for the governments to be receptive. During the height of the Cold War, I was the uh, representative to the UN of Lawyers Alliance for World Security. I was practicing law at the time. I was not a full-time activist like I am today. And uh, we had an initiative with the then Soviet Union of bringing lawyers from the Soviet Union to the United States and sending lawyers from the United States there. There was a similar initiative with physicians called International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. They won a Nobel Prize. They were, they were much more public than we were. Um, there was also a scientific exchange in the Pugwash conferences. They also won a Nobel Prize for those exchanges, which took place when the governments were mutually demonizing each other. What we did, what I was very involved in, was bringing dozens and dozens of lawyers from the Soviet Union and showing them jury trials in the United States where public citizens were administering justice. We took them to bankruptcy court. Imagine when they asked, you mean the state is giving people freedom from the debt to the rapacious capitalist banks? Yes. And then they met US attorneys and they asked, "How will you prosecute the political party that put you into office? And they said, of course we will. And that, that's been at risk during the Trump years, but it's been part of our tradition. But what really turned their heads around was when they met, we, I, I did this in my home, I actually had a, a federal district judge come, and there were 40 lawyers from the Soviet Union. And she explained that she was holding the city of Philadelphia, the state, in contempt of court for overcrowding in prisons. And they said, well, what gives you the power to do this? She said, I'm the judge. And I think it's cruel and unusual to have eight people in a cell designed for four. They said, where does it say that in the law? She said, our Constitution gives me the power and says there should be no cruel and unusual punishment. Now, the idea that the state was being subject to the rule of law, I could see this turn their heads around. Those people, years later, became the advocates of Glasnost and Perestroika. And the lawyers from the United States, years later, who had been to the Soviet Union, were supporters of changing, changing the dialogue. So I have di direct experience in seeing that you don't have to wait for the governments to be supportive of it, that you can, if you can, if you're in a situation where you can build those bridges with professional organizations, with, 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 with universities, um, particularly professional organizations, because these are people who are the, are the uh, weave of the structure of society. That's really worthwhile. Um, the other example that I would give is the Middle Powers Initiative was eight international organizations, and uh, I was one of the founders of that. And we did conferences, but they were, we did conferences in 2000, 2005, 2010 around the NPT, and many of the, and we, but we invited governments to participate with, uh, with us. We convened the governments in preparation for the NPT. So when there was a period where there was a positive attitude of the governments, but it was civil society that did the convening. And so, so we were able to infuse a more progressive agenda than the diplomats could put forward. 
And one of the things that we did is we asked for more than we thought we could get so that the, that the moderate proposals would in, be infused in the process. Diplomats can't do that. They can't appear, they're representing their nations, they can't appear to be irrationally demanding. But we could. So we took positions that we knew we weren't going to get, but that gave legitimacy to the compromise position which we felt was reasonable. Without that progressive voice, diplomats are forced to put the reasonable position as the beginning of negotiations. You wouldn't buy a car that way. You, you know, you wouldn't begin your proposal with the, with the amount of money you'd be willing to buy it for. You might say, I'll pay a lot less. So civil society can be enormously, uh, and, and in democracies, I think we have a moral obligation to exercise our agency on these existential issues and step up. And universities certainly have a role to that. And a university founded on the Lotus Sutra, uh, a teaching of human unity, compassion, and values, it's, you know, it, makes them, it makes enormous sense to do so. Um, I'd also like to comment that uh, part of civil society are also the religious voices. And of course, the religious leaders have uh, huge constituencies and access to these constituencies. So they, per their presence can have a lot of persuasive impact to be able to mobilize their constituents behind the cause of preventing, eliminating, abolishing nuclear weapons. So for example, uh, we had Mahatma Gandhi. He was not a religious leader, but in his own way became one. And he, of course, was the great proponent of ahimsa or nonviolence. And he was very much against uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, and uh, his protege, in many ways, was Dr. Martin Luther King, who in his Nobel uh, speech at uh, Oslo University, had made it very clear that uh, nuclear weapons were to be abolished following the principles of ahimsa nonviolence. And he articulated very clearly uh, that you know, we have to follow the ways of peace, we have to follow the ways of love, the ways of the heart and caring for each other. And of course, uh, Daisuke Ikeda has been a very famous um, uh, intellectual as well as proponent of the abolition of nuclear weapons. And the reach of his uh, influence we can see here at this university and all around the world. Uh, so that is the uh, you know, Buddhist component. We also have Pope, uh, the Pope indicate he took a strong stand when he visited uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki against nuclear weapons. So we must never underestimate 84% of the world's population are believers and adherent to some faith tradition. So we also must not underestimate the importance of religious leaders to give not only the voice of inspiration, but to constantly remind us of our moral obligation, our moral compass to respect the sanctity of life and to honor each life with the, the um, dignity that all things sacred deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I believe that our online speakers have uh, comments as well. Uh, Ms. Lakeda, do you, do you have a, a comment? Yes, thank you so much, and thank you for the uh, great question, and also uh, to the panelists who spoke uh, already. Uh, I absolutely think the civil society and public uh, has such an important role in this regard. And especially, I think in the presentations earlier uh, by, by many of the panelists, we heard about uh, the importance of rejecting the deterrence uh, as the national security policy and uh, importance of legitimizing and devaluing the role of nuclear weapons in security. And I think that's, done, that's one area, if not the most important area the civil society can seriously impact uh, by creating such discourse and uh, lowering the value of nuclear weapons. But I think the question then is how might we do that? And I think, um, Jonathan, I can't remember if you mentioned this in the presentation or it could have been one of our uh, personal conversations, but 
you mentioned that many Americans uh, actually think that no first use is the current policy. They don't realize that first use is the policy. So I think in that regard, education, I would have to emphasize again, is such an important tool. And we really have to, as civil society, as academics, university, uh, have to be part of the voice to educate the public who may not know, for, no, uh, first of all, no first use is not the current policy and also the humanitarian consequence of nuclear weapons. Because I think if people know such facts, I would hope that many would agree that it's not logical to use or rely on the nuclear weapons as a security policy. Uh, and then the other part of that, uh, and I think as uh, Japan is the host country, I really respect and admire the work of the civil society in Japan, especially uh, the people of Hiroshima, the activists, uh, and also our survivors. And their voice has been such a crucial element of civil society's consciousness uh, on this issue. And I really think their work has to be um, really highlighted in the G7 summit. And I also think uh, you know, for us to be effective as the civil society community, uh, any efforts that can unite our voices and coordinate our efforts is also important. So for example, uh, we are part of the C7, the civil society seven uh, process, uh, working with other NGOs uh, who may also have different approaches and opinions about how we might achieve a world without nuclear weapons. But I think it's important that we work together, forums like this, you know, our conference and bringing our recommendations together because I think a civil society was stronger when we are united. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Kurosawa, do you have any comments? Okay, just one uh, word. Uh, civil society in a wider sense include academics and experts. And Abisai is there. Abisai and me established Japan Association of Disarmament Studies 13 years ago. And we are from the scientific point of view discussing this issue and sometimes different from the government opinion. But I think as a civil society, we are working very well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other comments or questions? Very good, good afternoon. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm not a student. I'm not a professor. <laughs> I only a neighbor uh, of this uh, Soka University, uh, and I'm very happy to be here. And uh, I would like to ask you, uh, thinking about the name of this conference, Advancing Security and Sustainability, uh, if you could do a little or maybe a great effort to think about the possibility uh, of uh, uh, this disarmament uh, took place uh, in these moments, uh, what would be the subjects that we will be dealing in this conference? I mean, uh, if uh, all the countries uh, that uh, we are waiting uh, approve this uh, disarmament, um, which would be the steps or which would be the actions that would follow to? These. Many of the steps that are needed have already been promised by the state's parties to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is a treaty that's almost universal. Every nation in the world is a party to this treaty, except for four, North Korea, India, Pakistan, and Israel, every other nation. And they have a, a, a legal duty in the treaty to negotiate the elimination of nuclear weapons. But it doesn't say how they will do that. So they have had a series of conferences in which this, the members of the treaty unanimously have set forth promises to fulfill that obligation by doing certain things which are, in a way, the architecture of things that we know could be done that would move in that direction and change relationships between states. For example, bring into force a comprehensive test ban treaty. Negotiate a treaty stopping the production of any nuclear weapons capable fissile materials. Strengthening the international atomic energy safeguard regime. Lowering the operational and political status of the weapons. That would be no first use or de-alerting the weapons. These are steps 
that have been agreed upon in the context of the treaty that they have not been lived up to. They, the, the states with the weapons say, trust us, we'll have strategic stability. The diplomats negotiate in good faith. They go back to their capitals, and the militaries come in and say, are these legally binding? No, they're political commitments. And they say, we would prefer to pursue military advantage rather than strategic stability. That's where we are now. So the steps are known to move in that direction. A simple way of looking at it would be, as President Biden once said many years ago, don't tell me your values, show me your budget. So since 2000, when the Millennium Development Goals were set forth, which is a human security agenda for peace, now the Sustainable Development Goals, an integrated human security agenda, the world has spent in excess of $32 trillion in pursuing security through the threat or use of force. If a very small portion of that were dedicated to fulfilling the Sustainable Development Goals, which require us to work together to protect the climate, to obtain gender equity, to make sure that there's potable water for everybody, to end corruption, which is stealing trillions of dollars from the normal economy, advancing the rule of law, good governance, all of these matters that are so common sense, they're not being applied because the money is going to, to these, to these uh, endeavors based on fear rather than cooperation. Just take corruption, for example. The amount of money that, that is illicitly taken from the people of the world, if that were captured, if that were captured, uh, I represent the International Anti-Corruption Academy in, in, at the United Nations. I'm the permanent observer for that. So I've seen that that one issue would make a huge difference if we captured that money. If we, if we applied the promises of of, uh, of, of, of climate change and the Sustainable Development Goals and made our economic markets, for example, accurately reflect the impact of corporate entities on the climate, then fossil fuel companies would have to report the captured assets underground that they can't use. Just truth. But the, but the pathway toward a nuclear weapons-free world first begins with living up to the promises that have already been made. And we know the pathway. But the most important part is people like you and I putting pressure on our political leaders to have the political will to get there and make the change. Are there any other questions? Back to the woman in the light green Right here with the glasses, yeah. <laughs> yes. Hello, thank you. <laughs> so I will take the opportunity. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. So my name is Sima. I'm studying here in the uh, International Peace Studies program, and I am from Russia. So yeah, I have a lot of questions. So uh, several speakers said today about uh, how trust is meaningful and like how it can be a first step to the nuclear disarmament. So my question is, uh, what maybe agreements, what type of agreements would you expect, uh, would you hope to see from this G7, uh, G7 uh, where half of the countries are holders of the nuclear weapons and Russia is not joining anyways? So what can be real actions that can be, what can be real agreements from this G7? And like how I, as a Russian who is not living in the country currently, how can I um, affect something? Can I ask you a personal question? Why are you not in Russia at the moment? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, I came last year to study. <laughs> Peace studies. Okay, and I, I wanted to ask you another question then following up to that. In your peace studies, uh, you raised the important word trust, which 
I also brought up in my presentation, as trust is the currency of diplomacy. And trust is an inherent uh, modality and important value by which we engage with each other. If you don't have trust of a person, whether in your personal life, whether in your work life, in any situation, then the you know wanting to engage, you don't want to because you can't trust the person. Trust inherently implies integrity and that it is a mark of your moral compass that you will keep your word. And so this integrity also goes to your veracity, your truthfulness as a person. So these are actually moral values that are very important that establishes the foundation of human relationships. So to the extent we are in breach of the moral compass, our ethics, our values, then the manifestation of that breach is outwardly made known. And uh, so it is very important that each and every one of us, including our political leaders, including the, the person in everyday life, including in uh, hum, uh, husband and wife relationships, you must have the ability to trust. So the development of education, uh, peace education, as Anna Ikeda said, but it's also the education of the heart and the values that are important, that actually is foundational to how we conduct ourselves in our daily lives that establishes our veracity, our integrity, our honorableness in living life daily. This is a daily thing. And so this is the important aspect that we must all be able to master and the mastery of the self is very difficult. In the political stage, however, this aspect of power dynamics is very important. And the play of power dynamics is the egoic self in action that we get to see. And it is automatically um, a divestment and alienation from an understanding of the true self. And therefore, this education, moral education, uh, is foundational to even peace education. So now, how do we apply that to the countries? Just as George Schultz indicated, as I said in my presentation, trust is a currency of diplomacy, and uh, this also requires the self-examination, the self-reflective nature that Rory was talking about, that countries, leaders, through their leaders, and each and every one of us must be able to embrace. Let me just briefly add that there are so many unilateral things that we could do on nuclear disarmament to reinvest some trust back into the international system. I mean, there's absolutely no reason to have the amount of weapons that we do in order to uh, secure our own sovereign territory. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, the way that I would look at trust in the international system with regard to the G7, you rightly pointed out that some of the major players are not involved. Um, but to the extent that the G7 countries can just live up to their own commitments, um, that reinvests trust into the international system. It makes it possible for other states to follow suit. It puts pressure in the international community to lower the temperature. And I think any one of those things would be incredibly, enormously value, valuable right now. Um, we cannot turn the tide toward peace unless we stop now what we're doing that moves us towards war. So starting there at a stopping point at the G7 with commitments to eventually reduce our stockpile of our own nuclear weapons would be an excellent opportunity. And our online uh, guests, do you have any comments? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I uh, would like to really thank you, uh, the person who asked the question for your courage and also 
your commitment to studying peace and you know really being here. I think you know, uh, especially um, among the public and civil society, and maybe uh, you know in the places of study like the university, when we talk about Russia, you know, in such an abstract uh, way of nation state, you know, it's a vague concept, you know, this faceless entity, but it's a collection of people, you know, person like you. And I think, you know, you being in Japan somehow has this great meaning that you're giving, you know, this face of, uh, you know, people who are suffering in Russia as well. So I think you can really deepen uh, the understanding of human security at such an important level. Um, I absolutely agree with Rory that uh, I think importance of unilateral actions, you know, when uh, nation states talk about uh, security and deterrence, it's so easy to think about what others do and then use that as an excuse to uh, make whatever actions they would like to take in response. But there are many things uh, they can be doing unilaterally to, uh, you know, work toward peace. So I think it's important that you know, as individuals, as civil society, we encourage, uh, you know, our governments, our leaders to think about, instead of thinking about, um, of course, it's important to think about national security and protecting our, our own security, but at the same time, what can each country do to promote peace and uh, gain trust? Another thing I would like to add is the importance of communication. Uh, I think you know there was an example about you know China and uh, U.S. relations and the lack of communication can really create this misunderstanding of you know different kind of posturing and it being offensive versus uh, defensive. And I think you know I definitely worry, especially in light of the the New START Treaty and the communication between the U.S. and Russia, uh, you know, being obscure that can also uh, deteriorate the trust that that's already in danger, but you know, it can make the situation even worse. So I think we cannot emphasize the importance of uh, you know, such measures like communication. Uh, those could be a small measure, but I think uh, building up, uh, we can really uh, lead to creating trust in the international security environment. And Jonathan had one last comment. Uh, I had the privilege of being a guest at Seliger twice, uh, Putin's elite youth camp and met many people of your generation there, came away enormously inspired, enormously um, confident that the world can change. So I would just want to say to you, please be careful. Please be careful. Um, little perspective. Not so long ago, when you were very young, the President of the United States led the people of the world in my country to believe that when we invaded Iraq that the people of Baghdad would greet us with celebration and flowers. And my wife said, no, nah, I don't think so. And when President Putin said that the people of Kiev would greet Russian troops with flowers and celebration, I said to my wife, no, nah, I don't think so. Governments, your government, my government, are imperfect. The difference is this. In some governments, like this one here in Japan, people can speak freely and thus make corrections. Governments are always going to make mistakes. People are, people are just, that's how humans are. That's why free society is so important, so we can be, speak freely and correct the mistakes that we make. Right now in Russia, you can't do that. It's dangerous. So I can see that you have a free heart and a free mind and I urge you to be careful because what, what you have studied, what you've experienced, that you've, that you've seen outside of your cultural fishbowl, that you, you've, you've traveled, you're part of that cosmopolitan, brilliant youth that I saw in Russia, that are part of the future that will build a world that crosses borders for peace. This season, you have to be careful. Play the long game. Because those values that you have, that, led you, that have led you to go around the world and learn, those values of the human family are the hope for the future. Governments will not lead in this. Governments did not lead in human rights. Governments did not lead in gender equity. Governments did not lead in environmental responsibility. It is people that do this. And it's people like you with courage and curiosity that will be the future. And thank you for, for, for being that way.
want to say thank, thank you to our, our panel for the wonderful comments and the, our panelists online as well. I uh, also want to thank you for your questions and uh, thank you very much.